Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is June 24th, 2023. This video is called Judgment Begins with God's People. For you who have been listening to me uh, for a while, you know that uh, for the last two years I have endured a lot of sickness <clears throat> and I didn't know uh, what really the source was until um, a few months ago. It turns out that the symptoms that I've been having since uh, February of 2022 are considered to be symptoms of what they call long COVID. Uh, symptoms like uh, the feelings of stroke, heart attack, high blood pressure, uh, tinnitus, <clears throat> fatigue, uh, foggy headedness, things like that. So uh, <clears throat> it's been a very difficult two years. And in the midst of that, I also have not felt the, the presence of God in a way that um, I'm used to, in a way that uh, I would expect, especially in these very difficult times that we live in. <clears throat> We clearly are seeing uh, the very end of this age approach. And COVID, of course, is one of those signs that tell us that. And, and it was really a rehearsal for the mandatory mark of the beast that is soon to be implemented. Um, so we all need to be aware of that. Things, were ne was, things will never, ever return to what we consider to be normal. Uh, we have we have come into something uh, unlike anything that uh, we have ever seen before. We're seeing the fulfillment of of the prophecies of the great prophecies of Scripture. <clears throat> um, that reminds me of uh, one of the verses that I need to go to in this. Uh, video today and I need to write that down real quick so I don't forget it so um, bear with me just a second here so um, of course I've been praying about what is going on why God is treating me this way um, <clears throat> why he hasn't seen fit to heal me or my wife. My wife has also been very sick for the last two years, even though her symptoms have been very different than mine. Well, it was just this past week that I feel like the, the Lord finally gave me an answer to what I'm enduring, what I'm going through. Uh, one of the things I want to say, <clears throat> first of all, I would only have known this or found this out if I had continued to read God's Word. God's Word is our food, our life, our sustenance. We have to stay in His Word even when we don't feel His presence because God speaks through His Word and that is our food. Jesus said we must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And he's talking about the spiritual reality of who he is. Well, who is he? He's the Word. He's the Word of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. And so I continue in God's Word, and I continue praying, even though I don't feel presence. I usually don't feel that I get any answer to what I'm praying. And it's very frustrating. I'm sure many of you have been there. So, the verse that he gave me that began this was Psalm 60, verse 3. And let me just read the 
first few verses here. This is a psalm of David. O oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry. O oh, restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches, for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. Now look who's writing this. David, when David was a victorious king, the introduction to this psalm says, to the choir master, according to Shushan Eduth, a mictum of David for instruction, when he strove with Aram Naharaim and with Aram Zobah, and when Joab on his return struck down 12,000 of Edom in the Valley of Salt. So here we are really at a time of great strength for David. And yet he says, Oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You've been angry. Oh, restore us. In verse 3, You made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. Well, what is this wine that he's making his people drink? It's the wine of wrath. It's the wine that is going to be poured out upon the whole world. Before we get into that idea too much, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter, in his suffering. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So, you know, we've all heard that scripture, judgment begins with the house of God. But, have we really understood it? Well, let's look at another scripture. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 25. Dealing with this cup of wrath that David introduces in Psalm 60 verse 3. Jeremiah says, starting in verse 15 of chapter 25, Thus... I am, the God of Israel said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from I am's hand and made all the nations to whom I am sent me drink it. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah its kings and officials, to make them a desolation and a waste, a hissing and a curse, as at this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, his officials, all his people, and all the mixed tribes among them. Well, wait a minute. Where did it start? It started with Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. It started with God's people this cup of wrath. And then it goes to Pharaoh. 
And then, verse 20, And to all the kings of the land of Uz, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, to their great cities Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, to Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon, to all the kings of Tyre, all the kings of Sidon, and the kings of the coastland across the sea, Dedan, Tima, Buzz, and all who cut the corners of their hair, all the kings of Arabia and all the kings of the mixed tribes who dwell in the desert, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of Medea. Well, Elam was Persia, and then Medea is mentioned, and that's who becomes who, or who become the rulers of the earth after Babylon. 26. To all the kings of the north, far and near, one after another, and all the kingdoms of the world that are on the face of the earth. To all the kingdoms of the world. Take this cup, the Lord said to Jeremiah. So this is prophetic, isn't it? It's talking about now. And after them, the king of Babylon shall drink. Babylon the Great. The great judgment we see in Revelation chapter 18. Then you shall say to them, Thus says I am of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink, be drunk and vomit, fall and rise no more, because of the sword that I am sending among you. And if they refuse to accept the cup from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, Thus says I am of hosts, you must drink. For behold, I begin to work disaster at the city that is called by my name. And shall you go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished. For I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares I am of hosts. You therefore shall prophesy against them all these words and say to them, I am will roar from on high and from his holy habitation utter his voice. He will roar mightily against his fold and shout like those who tread grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. The clamor will resound to the ends of the earth for I am has an indictment against the nations. He is entering into judgment with all flesh and the wicked he will put to the sword declares, I am. Thus says, I am of hosts. Behold, disaster is going forth from nation to nation, and a great tempest is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. And those pierced by I am on that day shall extend from one end of the earth to the other. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall be dung on the surface of the ground. Wail, you shepherds, and cry out, Wail, you pastors, you teachers of God's word, and cry out, and roll in ashes, you lords of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and dispersion have come, and you shall fall like a choice vessel. No refuge will remain for the shepherds, nor escape for the lords of the flock, a voice, the cry of the shepherds, and the wail of the lords of the flock, for I am as laying waste their pasture, and the peaceful folds are devastated because of the fierce anger of I am. Like a lion, he has left his lair, for their land has become a waste because of the sword of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. So, am I going too far? Would God really do that to his people? Would he really allow them to suffer before he begins to judge the, the, the evil nations, the rest of the nations? Well, let's go to Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek, I am. So who's he talking to? He's talking to us. He's talking to us who believe. In him, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to those who believe in and obey Jesus Christ. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. 
you who seek I am. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For I am comfort Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of I am. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving in the voice of a song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the people. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Is God's law in your heart? See, that's when you really know that you know the Lord, when his law is in your heart and you cannot bend yourself to do evil. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings, for the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool, but my righteousness will be forever and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of I am. Awake as in days of old, generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep? who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over. And the ransomed of I am shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is made like grass? And you have forgotten I am your maker who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor when he sets himself to destroy. See, this is talking about now. Isaiah 51 and 52 are scriptures for the overcomers who are waiting for the time when God will reign. And God here is saying, don't be afraid of man who dies. Don't be in fear because of the wrath of the oppressor. We see what's coming. We see the oppression. And where is the wrath of the oppressor? He who is bowed down shall speedily be released. He shall not die and go down to the pit. Neither shall his bread be lacking. I am, I am your God who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. I am of hosts, is his name, and I have put my words in your mouth and covered you in the shadow of my hand, establishing the heavens and laying the foundations of the earth and saying to Zion, you are my people. Okay, these words are prophetic to the Zion of God, to those who will comprise new Jerusalem, to the overcomers of God. That's what I've just read, the beginning of Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 16. But now listen to this, verse 17. Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of I am the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. Whoa. Psalm 60, verse 3. David says, You've made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. Yes. Some of us have been given wine to drink that has made us stagger. Certainly has made me stagger these last two years. That's a long time 
Two years of staggering is a long, long time. It's a hard time. Back to Isaiah 51, verse 18. There's none to guide her among all the sons she is born. There's none to take her by the hand among all the sons she is brought up. These two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Devastation and destruction, famine and sword. Who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope and a net. They are full of the wrath of I am, the rebuke of your God. Hear this, therefore, you who are afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, I am. Your God who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering. The bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. And I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, Bow down that we may pass over. And you have made your back like the ground and like the street for them to pass over. So that's Isaiah 51, and the Lord promises to take the cup of staggering from us when it's time to put it into the hand of our tormentors. Then for chapter 52, awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, New Jerusalem. For there shall no more come into you the, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of I am to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For I am as comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. I am as bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Mm -hmm. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of I am. Now what's God talking about here? Clearly, these verses are dealing with the overcomers who will be glorified. But 11, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of I am. He's talking about leaving Babylon. Remember, we're told in Revelation chapter 18 to leave Babylon. Otherwise, we would partake of her sins and her plagues. Within Babylon are all the sins of the world. Within Babylon, we will partake of her sins and of her plagues. Her plagues are sicknesses that are going to get worse and worse. Some of us have already been sick with the plague that Babylon released upon the world, the COVID-19. But these verses make it clear that judgment begins with God's people. God allowed me to get sick. I thought I was protected, according to Psalm 91. I knew that COVID was a plague, and I thought that I would be protected from it. I got over it 
in December 2021 after seven days of the uh, unorthodox treatment that uh, is really the one that should be used. But it was two months later, two and a half months later, that I began to get the symptoms of stroke. And then after that, heart attack and the loud tinnitus and the high blood pressure and the incredible fatigue and lack of strength. And I expected God to keep me from that, but he didn't. He didn't. And he didn't answer my, my prayers for healing. And he hasn't answered my wife's prayers for healing. So what's the purpose? Why does judgment begin with God's house? We have to go to the book of Hebrews to understand this. Hebrews introduces Jesus in chapters 1 and 2, and he uses a lot of uh, scripture showing how Jesus fulfills the prophecy of scripture, the many prophecies of scripture. And then, chapter 2, verse 10 of Hebrews says this, For it was fitting that he, meaning God, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's speaking of Jesus. He is the founder of our salvation. For he who sanctifies, which is Jesus, and those who are sanctified all have one source, God. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. So Jesus calls us his brothers. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. So we are his brothers, we are his children. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the seed of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, what is it that we have been called to? Remember, Peter says we are a royal priesthood. The ones that God has called to be his sons are called to be priests in the same way that Jesus is a priest. Does it mean that our blood is the blood that saves other people? No. There is one, that's Jesus. But we also must suffer as he suffered so that we will be able to help those who are going to be suffering, who are going to be tempted, especially with taking the mark of the beast soon. God has done this in order to prepare us to make us ready for the ministry that is coming, for the purposes for which he called us. It's not an easy task. What Jesus went through was not an easy task. In fact, 
in the New Testament. And we'll just go ahead and go to this. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20. Twenty-two. I'll start. I'll start with verse twenty. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, "What do you want?" She said to him, "Say, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom." Jesus answered, "You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink?" And they said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my Father. Then I want to go to Matthew 26. Uh, verse 38. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then verse 42. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Well, what did he have to drink? Jesus had to drink the cup of staggering. It's the cup that we also have been drinking. Then as he was arrested in John chapter 18, after Peter cut off the high priest's servant, servant's right ear, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Shall we not drink the cup that our Father has given us to drink. This has been the hardest testing of my entire life. <clears throat> you know, without feeling the presence of God, with feeling sick, with feeling uh, almost pointless to get up, with seeing what's coming upon the world, with knowing what's coming upon the world, with people still not even paying attention. I mean, people still don't see it. It's, um, it is staggering. It is a cup of staggering. The cup has been given to us first. We must drink the cup that God gives us without turning away, without rebelling against God, without blaspheming God, without cursing God, as Job's wife counseled Job to do when Job drank the awful cup. And we don't know how it's going to turn out we don't know if we'll live or die during this season we're coming into. But we do know this.
that we belong to God. We are His. I myself have given myself to be His slave, His bondservant. He paid the price for me, and it was not an easy price to pay. And the life that he's given us is not an easy life to live. The cup staggered. That's why we're going through this. And because we willingly submit to God, then we will be useful for His purposes when what is about to happen, happens.